Paul, my name is Jeannie Perales. I'm Vice President for Museum Exhibitions, Learning and Engagement here at beautiful Selby Gardens. And it's my um, pleasure to introduce our presenter today, Elizabeth Murray. She's gonna give us a little wave here. Um, and she's all the way out in California, so it's only 9 a.m. for her. She's having breakfast while we're having lunch. But we're so thrilled to have Elizabeth join us. Um, and I wanna give you a little bit of background on her. So um, it's going to be presented by Elizabeth, who is an artist, author, and gardener. She's perhaps best known for her work helping to restore and cultivate Monet's garden and photographing them for 35 years. I think she started doing this when she was about 10, right, Elizabeth? <laughs> her photos uh, have traveled with Monet's paintings to eight museums and are published uh, annually in calendars and in her book, Monet's Passion, which you're gonna see the cover of when she starts her, um, her presentation. And I recommend it highly. I ordered it as soon as we decided to do this show and it's really fantastic. Her passion for nature and appreciation for beauty has inspired her dedication to projects around the world from remote African villages, the Amazon rainforest and Japan. She teaches, lectures, writes, gardens, and according to one phone call I had, prepares alfresco dinners in her garden with friends <laughs> and travels with groups of students eager to connect to the world, the earth, and to their own creativity through the art. In today's talk, she'll use the beauty of her photographic images, personal stories, garden metaphors, and a great sense of humor while sharing her work in Monet's famous gardens at Giverny. She even offers painting and photography weeks at the gardens at Giverny. So all this and more can be found at her website, elizabethmurray.com, and I'll put that in the chat so everyone can hear that, can see that. So today's lecture is, of course, connected to our current exhibition, Roy Lichtenstein, Monet's Garden Goes Pop. Um, and I hope that many of you have been able to come and, and see the exhibition. And if you've not, I hope you can. It's up through June 27th, and it's really just a fantastic show. Um, and it's, of course, the beauty and serenity of our gardens with a pop art twist. So before sharing, uh, before turning it over to Elizabeth, I'm going to share a one minute video with you. Um, and I hope you'll enjoy. And that way you get to see what the gardens look like right now. make you want to come here. <laughs> I want to mention that Elizabeth has about a 45 minute presentation today and afterwards we'll have um, some time for questions and answers and I invite you to use the chat uh, or the Q&A feature uh, at the end of the program. So without further ado I'm going to turn it over to Elizabeth and uh, thank you all again for being here. Can't hear you. Unmute them. Hello, everyone. Um, I wish I was in Florida to see your garden. Um, and that is such a different juxtaposition to have that pop kind of thing. It's um, completely different. I'm sure children love it um, and they could make something like that. So I'm going to show you my slide slideshow. And um, yes, it's been a 35 year personal relationship with Monet that I have had and continue to have as a painter today. He is my biggest muse as a painter gardener 
and someone I feel like I have a personal relationship with. So I'll be weaving a story that has, I, I have way more to tell than there is time, but botanical and stories about Monet and, and mainly around his garden that he considered to be his greatest, uh, greatest form of art. So let's see, we're gonna share the screen and pick this out and begin. So that's the cover of my book, uh, Monet's Passion. So some of you, I'm sure if we were there, I would ask you to raise your hands and tell me if you've been to Giverny. This is the little village of Giverny and the barn-like structure with the big, huge white panels on them are, are actually the third studio, the big studio that Monet, um, that was built for Monet to do his water lily um, panels in and so that's his house you can see the other little skylights and it's in this beautiful river valley with the that goes to the Seine the second group of trees over the other field and then there's a smaller little river that he diverted called the Rue or the Epp. So there's Monet's house on the right a long pink house that they have this kind of replica of in the gardens today and you can see a little bit of the arches which are also in the garden um, and that, that little arch is the Grand Ballet. But you can see the green, it's so green and um, beautiful. And this is an illustration from my book of the Claus Norman garden or the flower garden that is around his house. And you see the house is long and narrow. It's only one room wide. And you can see the little chickens on the right and on the far right is the big, huge barn-like studio going straight down from the front door is what we call the Grand Allée. And, and then at the base of that is a gate. And actually you go through the gate and there's a road, it used to be a railroad. And then you go through another gate and that would be, you'd be at the footbridge of his second garden that he made later, which is uh, where the Japanese uh, garden is, the Japanese footbridge. So the early spring in the garden is tulips, uh, two, two different shades of pink tulips underplanted with forget-me-nots, blue forget-me-nots in front of the house. And it's, you know, it's really lovely, of course. This is what I, it's kind of my pop work. Um, it, I call it my painterly photography. And I did this with the SX-70 Polaroid, those old Polaroids, and then they'd stay soft and I could draw on them. Then I'd enlarge them and put them on watercolor paper and then hand paint them. So uh, tulips, and these are um, with a, an, a allium, and then the uh, forget-me-nots. So playing with color, Monet really experimented, of course, with color, and color is all about light and how to play with the light. This is a, um, a iPhone photography of his garden that I put, used an app on to make it look a little more painterly. I love, of course, the tulips. They are so incredible. And at this point, you don't see the flowering, but you see the structures in front of his house. Layers and layers. I call it the blooming house. And then looking above, you start to see the irises, the beautiful bearded iris that are starting to pop into the garden. And each wave of coming of spring brings more and more. You can see the incredible bower of roses. They're climbing roses on these big structures and you see the irises and rainy stormy weather. It rains a lot in Normandy. It's like Ireland. It's very green and very rainy. And all divided Monet's garden around his house like that illustration showed is a lot of pathways and there's a lot of different little beds and then those the gravel pathways are for the gardeners and they allow the, the plants to go over and um, be very soft and wild. And so visitors don't walk on those paths. It's more ac access for the gardeners. Here is uh, the trellises in front of Monet's house starting to be totally in bloom. And this is the second there's three different steps that enter and these steps enter a, a room that that you could go to the left those big huge doors on the left were was his first studio that he had 
the studio that he made out of kind of a, a dirt floor in the beginning and this old house. And, and then he outgrew that and built another one. And these roses, that yellow rose is the mermaid rose right below his bedroom window. Right now, all the shutters are closed. It's early in the morning. And here's the front door with several types of roses. So there's layers, uh, potted plants, uh, bedded plants, the, the structures of the roses that are in front of the house, and then actually Virginia creeper growing on the house itself. So it's a great way to turn a not so, this was a cute house, but not that attractive house, stucco house, and, and really make it come alive. Now, one of the things that makes the, any garden, any place come alive is bringing animals in. And this is Fifi, the calico cat. And I love welcoming uh, birds and in my garden I have birds and squirrels and uh, some make mischief and all kinds of creatures that come in and they really make the garden lively. Uh, if you ever photograph cats, they it's all up to them. So she brought me over to these irises and turned and posed and told me to take her picture. So that's so beautiful. I love it when the bearded iris are in bloom. And the little edge in here is called a brisha, which is in, is a perennial and it's in the mustard family. And it has a gray, bluish gray foliage to it. And it blooms in this lovely lavender and, and pink and white, three colors you can choose from. So again, you kind of see the layers. It's like a big, huge sea of flowers. Um, the structure on the far left is Monet's second studio that he had a, a studio and then he made apartments for his children as they got older so they could live around there. And then you can see in the middle, a little uh, couple of little dormers. And that's the little house that they built for me when I went there to garden in 1985. So I got to look right into the garden and it was, it was a dream come true to be able to be a gardener there. Here are a couple of the gardeners um, working in the Grand Ballet. And I love it that the blue work jacket of the French matches the blue delphinium so beautifully. And there are hundreds of thousands of plants in Monet's garden. And down the Grand Ballet, you can kind of see it in this picture, it's um, built up quite high, at least three feet high in the middle. And then the rose arches are on top of that. Right above the gardener's head, that white spike is a foxtail lily, which are great for flower arrangements and so spectacular in the garden. So it's, it's just a abundance. It's probably the most planted and most flowers of any garden I've ever been to in the world. Uh, <clears throat> so here you, and there you see layers and borders and it's kind of the orderly disorder uh, with columns of roses and arches of roses. And, and it's a, a way to bring color up into the sky instead of just having everything on a flat plane. A lot of people don't think about that when they design a garden. Now here, this beautiful axis of the gravel path with all these irises. And one thing as a painter, you don't really want a total sea of flowers. It's nice to have a pathway that leads the eye and breaks it up so you can have the edges of the, the flowers showing. Here's one of Monet's paintings of those um, irises. And it's something that could be studied when the garden was being restored, the colors of the irises up close. And he, he liked to plant in monochromatic masses. So in big bulk, big color masses. So it's much easier as a painter to do that rather than a little pointless, a whole bunch of stuff. But, but it's all about capturing the light and what would, what would make a really great painting. Um, today they had mixed in some more of the chocolate color uh, iris with the purple. I don't think Monet would have done that. And there's still some of that golden wallflower from the winter there, which has a lovely fragrance. So when the irises are in bloom, I just want to stay. I don't ever want to leave them because they only really bloom well for a couple of weeks and then they're pretty well gone. Nowadays, you can get hybridized ones that bloom twice a year, but they have lovely sword-like foliage, which I really enjoy as well. 
Another gorgeous thing in that Monet's garden are these tree roses. And instead of just being one of those really stiff kind of uh, formal tree roses, these are grown on an umbrella like structure and they're more like a cascading rose, a multiflora that has long tendrils. So it grows, it's been grafted onto a rootstock and then onto a trunk. And then this wonderful cascade that gets supported underneath. And then you see some beautiful hollyhocks also, which, you know, it just gives you that, all those wonderful things to paint. And here's a painter in the garden. Um, and of course she's just enthralled to be able to see this beautiful kind of cloud of pink. Um, I took six different groups into the garden to be able to paint and photograph, which was lovely. Uh, we had early access and late evening access with beautiful light and no tourists. Here is the mermaid rose that we saw on right below Monet's uh, windows. And when I first got there as a gardener, I was a professional in Monterey and had nine people working for me and quit that so I could work for free in Monet's garden. Many people thought it was nuts, but I had fallen in love when I went there to see it. And I had uh, through a lot of um, tenacity and hope and optimism gotten a job there and quit everything, left my house in Carmel to move. And one of the ways to prove myself was Monsieur Valle, the head gardener said, um, prune, prune this rose. And it has really big thorns, as big as your thumb. And it was two stories high and about 50 or 60 feet wide. And I had to go up on a rickety ladder and prune and it was really hard work. And I had a pile of cuttings over my head and he put his hands on his hips. He said, you did a good job in French and uh, now move all those canes and you can do the rest of the roses. So that's how I proved myself as being a real gardener and not a bourgeoisie, which is what he had suspected because I was um, the first woman who ever gardened there. And I really had to prove myself. Plus I was a Californian and um, my French was poor. I only took two months of intensive French in Paris before I went out. But when you fall in love, you do a lot of things, as you know. So here's one of the wonderful arches full of roses and the, the flower border, really beautiful. And it's before the nasturtiums take over. And one of Monet's paintings looking down that same Grand Allee, you can see from his painting, especially on the right, the edge that the nasturtiums are just coming and the big trees, he left two of the, the tr yew trees that were there when he moved to the house. And then you can see the long rows of, of flowers of one color that he planted to go up. And one of the gardeners early in the morning, taking everything, they try to work really hard in the early mornings and um, when nobody is there and do all the weeding and all the big work before the tourists come because it's hard to work around all those visitors. So he has a wheelbarrow full of cuttings and the gate is open and he's going to go out there and they'll come with a little truck and take all those cuttings and make them into compost. And they have piles of compost and because of the soil is kind of chalky and they use a lot of co compost, especially in the autumn when Again, the gardens are not seen by the public and they enrich the soil. <clears throat> uh, something popular in, in Normandy are apples and this is an espaliated apple tree. So you have like a split rail fence that has um, these apples and these are dwarf apples that will grow them at two different heights. And then later on, you have a blooming fence and then later on you actually have wonderful uh, fruit. So it's a great thing to do and you can do it in a container. Here is one of those incredible, I think of them as rose clouds. And I spent a lot of time pruning these. Uh, I think that's why they're not very popular in America is there's so much work. But I think that they're just, you know, they're like a princess or a queen in the garden with the beautiful uh, peonies in the foreground, big, huge pink puff balls of peonies. Uh, a few irises and then the linaria, which is the purple and it has a wonderful white papery moon-like 
a seed pod that is very treasured. And one of my pain relief photographs of that same uh, cloud of, of roses. And there, there's one again. You see the stone fence in the back and then there's a, a trellis on top of that with roses. And Monet, when he moved to this house, the wall was quite high and he actually lowered it so that people passing by could look over and look at his garden and enjoy it. Uh, today, they've, they've made more privacy because now it's a big, huge um, road there. In Monet's day, it was just a railroad. And he actually found this house by going from Vitoy, where he used to live, um, and going into Paris and looking down and saying, oh, here's a little house for rent. And in three years was able to, to buy it. And there's Monet with his first gardener, Florence, and with big, tall delphiniums and gladiolas at his feet. And in the early days, you can see the house in the background, he did the gardening and his children helped with the watering uh, with you know buckets, there weren't hoses. And they grew vegetables and fruits and flowers so that his spirits were up and he had great things to, to paint. And later he got more popular, his, his work bloomed and he hired his first gardener and later he had up to six gardeners. Here's one of the wonderful little pathways. And I really like the small pathways the best. And I love how there's arches that are covered with roses. And I love things that are meandering and not just all straight paths. It's kind of like a life um, that usually we don't take straight paths. Usually we meander a bit. And hopefully we have some wildness in our life as well. And looking at textures and colors and movement. And you can, as a gardener or an artist, you can plan something, but you have to be flexible because you don't know really how it's gonna turn out. Uh, this is an iPhone photography with a little bit of um, an app on it to make it a little more illustrative. And looking up, you can see the second studio there and a, a hedge. The, the garden is really a walled garden. So you have a sense of, of privacy around it. And the different kinds of light. Uh, I love the mist. And of course, I love the poppies. And there's about seven varieties of poppies that grow in Monet's garden. And here we see a couple of them. The little small red ones are coquelicot, which are the wild poppies. And then the big lavender ones that have a dark spot at the, at the base are called bread seed poppies, the same uh, seed that you use like on a poppy seed cake or something. And they're also opium poppies. And then those big orange ones are oriental poppies, usually by those by the roots. And then you see the, here, here you see some more poppies together with the coquelicot. And Monet really preferred to have, um, he liked to have a lot of wildflowers in his garden. And he liked to have single petaled flowers quite a bit. And the, one of the benefits of a single petal flower, of course, is that the light goes through it. The light um, is more, gives you that idea of a stained glass window. Here you see the different layers and the different foliages and the coquelicot that, that really allows the light to come in. And it's part of the wild and the cultivated together. And Monet would walk the hills around Giverny and collect collect plants, collect seed, collect those wild orchids and put them in the garden. So you always have that surprise. And when he traveled, he would bring seed back and plant it himself or give it to one of the gardeners to plant. And on one of his travels to Italy, he actually uh, got, he tasted zucchini and brought back the seed. And he was the first to grow zucchini in, uh, in France. And another thing about poppies that are so lovely is the way that they catch the, the water, the mist, and they make it like mercury. And so it's like a little magic touch. And anything you have in your garden that gives you that sense of awe or delight is so important because it brings us back to wonder and inspiration. So now we're gonna go and look at the pond garden and that Monet built some years later. And he, this is him by his, um, 
by his pond. And you can see he's really had a, a sense of style. His tweed uh, pants have are uh, buttoned on the bottom so that when he walked through grass, he wouldn't get all wet. And his shirt has some ruffles on it. He always smoked. Um, that was a constant for him. And he usually wore a hat. Um, this is earlier in his life. Later in his life, he often wore a, a straw hat to protect his eyes. And he built this, originally it was, a. I saw it in your garden, you made some replicas, but at a curved Japanese footbridge inspired by some of his uh, Japanese woodblock prints that he collected. Uh, Japan had just opened up to Europe and was a big influence on the Impressionists for, for design and a plant material and point of view and simplicity. Even it, it, was, it was really important. And uh, so this was one of the inspirations. That is the small footbridge in the back of the garden. And it goes over a weir. Um, right behind it is where the, the little stream is, the little creek. And then they can turn down the weir and allow fresh water to come into the pond. And then on the other side, there's another weir. And then they can, they're like small hand, hand turning dams. And they can change the water level of the pond. There's going to be a huge rain then it's good to lower the pond level so it doesn't over flood. And this garden did flood uh, three different times. And during the periods of flood, um, when it was huge flooding, it, it spilled over across the road and into the flower garden. And the whole Seine River was flooded. I mean, Paris has gotten flooded and it really ruined so much of this garden. And but Monet took each time and said, okay, we're gonna improve this garden. And he enlarged his garden each time, making it bigger um, and more extravagant, more beautiful. This yellow iris in front of us, we might call it a Louisiana iris, but it is also a native in Europe and it likes its feet in the water. And so it's, it's between that wild and cultivated. You see those wonderful round leaves across the pond, and those are one of the Japanese plants, uh, Petasite japonica, and I love them. I love their big round foliages and the way they reflect. And of course, we, we are familiar with the weeping willow, and they were, they were a signature tree of the pond and something Monet planted a lot. And it's called weeping willow. And a lot of times it is referred to as something about grief. And when Monet did his paintings just of the weeping willow, they were about grief. They were about coming out of World War I and the loss of friends, the loss of family members, the loss of his country being under such stress. So he made these paintings uh, to symbol that. The the pathway curves around and of course it, it changes according to the light and according to the season and what's in bloom. You see some blue irises in the foreground here and, and those are I think a Siberian iris. And one of my painterly photographs um, of the pedicite and the iris along that uh, pathway. And there's those pedicides. It's so wonderful when you do flower arranging or you do garden design to think about different shapes of foliage and the, sh and the colors of foliage, even if you're doing it all in greens, how, how they change color. And this floating, these different planes to have the wonderful water and then to have the floating planes of the water lilies is so beautiful. And then of course, Monet was just so great on using arches and different structures. So this is the boat dock. It has curved concrete uh, steps. And this is where the little boat that would be used by the gardener to clean the surface of the pond and also to feed those water lilies. This is where it would be brought up. And it had two benches side by side across there that Monet, of course, would love to sit in and just observe. I think to be a good painter, you have to really look 
you have to be present and you have to really see the light changing. So as he would sit there and observe, he could see, oh my goodness, this is a whole world. Everything is inverted. Uh, the sky is part of the plane. The water lilies float, the foliage is upside down. And it gave him an idea to start to paint in that way. And so he became the first Western painter to paint without a horizon line. Usually we see paintings and you know where the sky is and where the land is. And he made it so it was a watery world and quite beautiful. And one of the things that inspired him, and I understand you're gonna have a lecture on it, which will be interesting, uh, is that during the late part of the 1800s, there was a wonderful botanist who started to hybridize water lilies. And it used to be just plain yellow and white water lilies. And then there was some extravagant ones that were exotics that would freeze. And he started to hybridize them so that they could be uh, more colors. And he showed them off at the World's Fair in Paris. And Monet was like, oh my God, look at this. And I must make a water garden. So he was inspired by a new plant palette that came available, the water lilies, a lot of plants started becoming available from Japan as Japan opened up. So they could have something exotic. Maybe we don't think of um, agapanthas or bamboo as exotic, but back then it was coming right from the Orient, these pedicytes and so, and then here's one little piece of one of the wonderful long uh, paintings, one of the panels of the water lilies. And you see the sky, you see the clouds and the sky and the willows and the water lilies. And it would drive him nuts. He'd go, How am I ever going to paint this? And nobody was doing this. You know, he was breaking through <clears throat> and to do his really, really large paintings. So, but it takes sitting and looking. And he painted alongside the pond, made many, many paintings, looking at the light. And then when his, he had this idea that he wanted to make these whole rooms of water lilies, rooms that would envelop people and give them the sense of grace and the sense of beauty and just kind of like put them in the environment as though they were with him in the pond. So we talked to his good friend Clement So about this idea and that he would like to give them to his country as a bouquet, as a peace offering, as something to soothe their soul. And we all know when we go to the botanic garden or we're sitting by water or we're with beauty that we feel more at peace. And it's so important to each of us to have that opportunity. So he thought, well, what can I do? What can I contribute? I can't bring thousands of people to my garden, but if I could create this in paint and have these oval rooms where people could come in and be surrounded by the beauty and the grace that I feel. So that was his um, inspiration. And it's quite remarkable to think about as a person in his late seventies and eighties. So here's the wonderful, uh, bridge just beginning to bloom. You can see there's two different kinds of wisteria, uh, the lavender and the white, and they have different blooming times. They also have the Japanese and the Chinese varieties so that that increases the blooming time as well. And Monet did quite a few paintings before he had the wisteria uh, arbor on it. And this is one that's quite blue. And he'd work with Again, this is you know a lot of blues and greens. Sometimes, of course, you go crazy because all the greens seem the same. There's so much green, and you just really want to have more blossoms. So this is a lovely painting, and it was really the early paintings, and then the later part of his life, he did a lot of wild paintings of the of the bridge and a little boat that the gardeners use. And eventually, when he had more money and the garden became his most important focus of his work. He hired one gardener who was in charge of just uh, the water lily pond and would go out in this boat and it's very flat bottomed and row and then have a big rake and rake off 
the surface and clean the water lilies. And he wanted them of course rake so that it would be really clean and clear for his reflections. Local brides like to stand under this um, wisteria arbor and have their picture taken when it's all in white like this. So beautiful. It's just part of heaven, uh, definitely. And from this bridge, when you look across, it is so beautiful. So looking, I'm now looking across at the Blooming Bridge and you can see mostly the white uh, wisteria and a little bit of lavender. I used to go into the boat as well to take some photographs because sometimes you can't, even if you have a good lens, you can't get across the pond enough unless you're right in it. Um, and I had a funny story of having a friend come, come one time, I rarely brought people and, and she's like, oh, let me help you. And I turned my back and my, my uh, camera was on a tripod in the boat. And the thing I had to row with was the net to clean it. And I actually dunked my whole camera in the water. It was over. Um, so here's Monet by his uh, bridge. And you can see the border is very simple. It's very simple. It's, it's like a gravel uh, walkway and a lawn border. And then those are probably daylilies or agapanthas in front of him. Today, they have a lot more plant material, but I think they'll be simplifying it now. I hope they will. And there, I think that's so charming. That little island beyond the boat is all irises and they bloom different, you know, different times. Now the, the gardener should, Monet would have the gardener out there cleaning that pond surface. It has uh, too many little algae and uh, leaves floating on it. He, he wouldn't have liked that surface, but it is quite lovely anyway. And there's a painterly of that boat with the wisteria. And Monet, a lovely place to be, to look out. And you can see he's quite older now, white beard, and he's wearing his straw hat. And as most of you know, he really, his eyes did start to suffer a lot, like a lot of us who spend time outside and start to get older. Um, so he had to have a cataract operation because his eyes started to get more, um, his colors got off. And here's, I worked with a doctor, uh, eye doctor in Stanford, and we used one of my photographs. And he said it got very yellow and more blurred like this. And then at one point, it, this doctor felt it got this uh, dark and this um, blurred for Monet. And it was very hard to get a um, cataract operation, very frightening. So in Monet's day, you, he only got one done. He had to do it three times and you had to be um, not moving and have sandbags around you for several weeks, very frightening. So here's Monet with one of his really big water lily panels, the murals, and it is in the third studio that was built. Now it's just a gift shop, but it's an incredible building with incredible skylights, huge skylights on both sides of the barn structure with special curtains that would filter the light. And look at his, his um, beautiful palette. It's like a huge water lily itself. Uh, the shape and then a couch and a chair to sit and look you have to look and these were on easels that had wheels on them so he could move the panels around and eventually these went to the orangery and a few got sold after his death and came to America so we we're fortunate you can go to uh, the Met in New York or Chicago and see them and then a few are here and there um, in Ohio and uh, Cleveland and other places like that. But they're just, it's so sensational. It's so exciting. I, I love this. And here's a close up of one of those paintings. And you can see it's a world. And he went from very exacting uh, paintings of people and dresses and light and parkways to this is much more abstract and much more um, a new way of looking and a new way of sensitivity. And I think this is what any of us as we age can hope for 
is to really come into your own in a mature and beautiful way. And the quality of the light. This is really working with, I think, uh, spiritual aspects of the light. And someone had called Monet a pantheistic priest, which is someone who's standing by and observing the light so closely and seeing the changes and then interpreting them in a, like a spiritual sense. So at the pond, as it starts to become autumn, you can see the changes. Some of the grasses are in bloom and some of the trees are, that are reflected are getting redder. The, the quality of the pond is really clean and clear. Looking across, you see the willows are beginning to turn golden and yellow and the liquid amber type of maple is getting red and orange. So it's wonderful to be able to go to, the, to know a garden as those of you who are gardeners to see the seasonal changes. I know in Florida, it's a lot more subtle. Um, like here in California, it's more subtle, our seasonal changes, but we still notice. In a place like this, it is quite um, important and you can design for your seasonal change. You can design for your colors of autumn or your berries in winter. Uh, this is looking through the moving uh, willow across over to the bridge. And there's different ways to design gardens and Monet's garden was very much designed, very uh, photogenically we'd call it, or very beautiful to paint, long vistas, focal points, um, and what he was interested in. Here we see more of the autumn color and the little flowers in the foreground are a wild um, impatience. Some, you might have those in Florida. And if you pinch the seed pod, they all pop out, they're quite fun. And they're also, they call jewel weed in some places. And if you get into poison oak or poison ivy, they can help you, um, the juiciness of them. And one of uh, Monet's paintings um, that is in the orangerie, it's a panel. And here we have the sunlight and the pink so this might have been at dawn or at dusk, these colors with the inverted, much more abstract. I was thrilled because my photographs, some of them made into mural size, got to travel with the late paintings of Monet. And so I really got to appreciate the late, more abstracted paintings. And at dawn, um, I call this the fairy light, when the dawn light is coming up through the wisteria on the on the bridge. I was fortunate that all my years, 35 years of going back after working there, going back to photograph, I was given a key to the garden and allowed to stay in my old apartment that they had built for me. And so it's been quite a privilege to be so close to this garden and to be able to have this intimate access to it. And the boat that, <laughs> as I told you, I've gone out in to photograph and get close to the water lilies and so on. So this is in February when I went back to uh, measure everything, make a plan of the garden for my book. And with everything dormant, except for a few daffodils, it's really interesting to see the importance of water for a focal point and structure. And right behind the water garden is a big field and part of the money uh, that was earned by people coming, uh, that field was bought um, so it could be saved and not built up or anything. It's really important and there's sheep that graze on it. So you see how the garden looks when it is in dormancy. And here it is a magical time when everything froze, including the pond and there was a little bit of snow. I think they had snow this winter when it snowed in Paris. So we're gonna go back over and this is a color photograph. The French were one of the first to have color chrome photography. And of course, everyone who could wanted to photograph Monet it was just incredible. So here he is standing in front of his house and you can see the house is completely covered with vines and a couple of the island beds in front of him and the pink and red geranium with a nasturtium growing up those columns. And then behind him are pink and white uh, standard roses with a pink geranium beneath. And that's that gray is a um, uh, little carnation. And here's Monet, a photograph of him in his dining room. You see the Japanese wood 
prints on his kitchen walls, I mean, dining room walls, and the table looks like it's set for lunch. It's in that there's Japanese and French ceramic on his, on his uh, mantle there. And how it looks today, very yellow, two shades of yellow. And the nice thing about using yellow is that when you have gray days, there's lots of gray days in Normandy. So that when the sunlight comes in, it reflects on the yellow and it really warms it up. It makes it more cheerful. So he was kind of an innovator to use so much color and to paint his furniture, paint his chairs, paint his furniture in shades of yellow. Um, he had rooms that were two shades of blue and, and I've done that here at my house is painting a lot of furniture and it's quite fun to do and it gives you a liveliness. Here's in the kitchen, food was really important to Monet as it is to many French, most French. Here's a beautiful uh, stove with a gorgeous blue and white uh, tiles and there's a kitchen door and it goes out and eventually he always had a cook that is really important in France, always have good food. And he eventually had the Maison Bleu when he bought a house down the road and had a gardener there just to grow up vegetables and fruits for the family. And so the gardener would come and tell the cook what, you know, what he had and she would know who was gonna be visiting. Uh, Monet liked to have people come for lunch so that he would take a break in the hottest part of the day, get up early, do his painting, They'd come for lunch, he could walk them around the garden and then maybe he'd get back to painting when the light was, was more um, warmer and overcast in the evening. All those beautiful copper pots, really lovely. Um, and the, the pretty blue and white tile. And you see the two shades of blue that he painted his furniture in. Here's the gardeners today, early in the morning, quickly pulling out those, uh, those tulips and getting ready to put in the geraniums. And that is a lot of quick work. And then the, uh, the beds with the pink geraniums in and the standard, these are standard Queen Elizabeth roses. And that open window above is Monet's bedroom window where he could look out over the garden. So as autumn comes to the garden, you have like huge, um, the scale is really different. The colors are different. The sunflowers are really tall and the pink reflects petal dahlias and big bouquets of the asters. This is one of Monet's favorite dahlias, um, cactus dahlia. And he liked the pink with the coral a lot. And the different quality of light in the autumn. And I love the, the enormous, it's really fun to be there and paint there because the scale is so, it makes you feel like a small person. And I think the gardeners are often like the unseen little elves that make the garden happen. There you see that the Virginia creeper on the house is completely turning red and changing. And there's cold frames. There's also greenhouses, growing greenhouses at, um, outside the garden walls. But in the garden walls are these um, this has a pipe going through it that can be heated with hot water and it has soil. And so all the seeds are planted there that directly into the soil. And then those uh, cold, those glass panels can be put down at night and kept warm. So they're kind of like growing houses. And then those, are, those flowers are taken out usually annuals and put into the garden. So this is one of the growing places. And the, everything has changed and moved and you know, there's color schemes and overlays. And in my book, I have overlays so that you can go, okay, here's the garden bed and here's autumn and here's spring. And <clears throat> so you see how the colors, the um, orangey red geraniums and then the yellow, um, here's the yellow uh, black eyed Susan underneath an apple tree. And you can see the irises, they've all been dug up and the rhizomes have been cut and they've been trimmed and the soil has been improved and they've been replanted. So they're ready. And Colomi, uh, the pink on the big spires and 
the big purple asters looking to the house. So it's, it's quite, um, here's part of the wild, the verbascum. Those are the spikes with the yellow and they have velvety soft uh, leaves and they're a wild plant. I love to grow them in my garden as well. And a fruit tree. It's lovely to have the trees, the fruit trees in the garden, trees that blossom and give you fruit. Always wonderful to combine that. And I like this combination of the, the claret, the burgundy um, dahlias with the lavender soft mauve uh, asters. And this is a pretty combination as well with the orange and the purple and the gold. <clears throat> Looking at the second studio. And as you can have really bright colors with that mist because it softens everything. Sometimes when you have really bright colors and really bright light, it looks very garish, I think. And so this really softens. And these are the paint box colors, actually. These are small little beds. You'll see them in my book, but little small beds that Monet would experiment with color. So if he did bulbs and then an overlay of annuals, then how do those colors really go together? A living color, a living color is completely different than color that we see in just paint or on fabric or something. And then he had these arches, um, squared off arches that he grew a very small um, white flowering uh, vine on and they would blow in the wind. Here we can see the um, lavender flowers uh, growing up in the lawn. And these, here they are there, and these are autumn crocus. And behind the autumn crocus, you can see one of the apple trees, the spalled apple trees, and they all have a good crop of apples. I think, um, and then here you see just a new one that has been uh, planted recently, and they'll be on different heights, those wonderful dahlias behind, and a big smoke bush um, that gives you that gray pinky texture, and the sunflowers. And looking at the third uh, studio. So you can see how the scale is so different and the color scheme is so different. And Monet, um, an older picture of Monet standing in front of his Grand Allee. And you can see the nasturtium path and the house behind him. And you can also see a big uh, tree trunk. And that was one of the trees that was going up and he, he left two trees. His second wife, Alice, really wanted all the trees kept, but he said, no, I have to grow flowers. So they kept those two and then he just limbed up the others and used them as uh, poles to grow more roses on. This is considered the last painting that Monet painted. It's quite large and very beautiful. And the edges all have canvas showing and it doesn't have his signature on it. It has one of the um, block signatures from the state. And I like, it's more like a haiku. It's more like, you know, this is the roses I love so much in the sky between and really a gesture, a gesture. So we're almost finished here looking down the Grand Allee. You can see how much, it, how different it looks with all the nasturtiums. Looking at the gate that goes and opens up. It used to be a railroad track and now it's the road and then another gate to the bridge. And then looking in the other direction to the house and it just looks so charming framed like that. And one of the gardeners tiptoeing down the path of nasturtium and he has actually a long pole pruners with him and he will actually be deadheading um, some of the big dahlias and whatever needs deadheading as he tiptoes down there. Some years, all those arches are very covered with roses. Some years they freeze and they get regrown and so on. So as you know, as a gardener, things always are growing and changing like our lives. So I want to, that's the end of my lecture. I try to keep it in the time length. Um, and I would be happy to take some questions. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. That was fantastic. It was just, just beautiful. <laughs> such a treat, like eye candy. <laughs> Yeah, it is. And I have a million more pictures and a million more stories. So 
I bet you do. Well, we've been getting lots of questions and comments throughout, so I've sort of pulled them into groups. Um, so I'll get started with a few, and anyone who's still with us and would like to ask some questions, feel free to put them in the chat um, or the Q&A. Oh, this is cute. Someone's asking if we can visit your garden in Carmel. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I do have, actually I have an open studio tour, and yes, you can. You can come and visit, and I have a a beautiful studio I just recently built and I do a lot of painting and I teach workshops here, but my garden doesn't look like Monet's. <laughs> Nothing like it. <laughs> yeah, it's much, much more modest, but it's quite charming. And it was the start of an artist colony in Monterey in 1900. So I've been restoring it for the last 21 years. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a lovely place and it's lovely to have classes and so on here. People come from all over. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. Oh, great. Yep. Um, so one of the questions that I got kind of over and over was, um, when is the best season to visit Monet's garden? Well, um, the, I love the spring. I love May and June. The, the hard part is that I don't know what it's going to be like now with post pandemic, but um, anyway, May and June are really wonderful. Um, and I also really love the end of September up to the first week of October. And that's when you have all those dahlias and asters and all of that big, big, huge scale, much messier. If you're a neat person and you like pastels, go in the spring. But um, it does tend to be more crowded. I can imagine. So somebody yeah. else asks, and I think I know the answer to this, but how did you get all these photos without um, people in them? Oh, because I got, I, I've been gifted. Um, I've, because I was a gardener there in 1985, I continued to be able to return and to be, and to be able to live in the apartment they made for me and to have access and a key to the garden. So it has been a great privilege so I go really early in the morning. I wake up at dawn and I go into the garden a lot of times before the gardeners. And then I, I'll stay. And in the, uh, well, in the summer, it can stay light till 10 o'clock at night. And I can continue to photograph sometimes some of the best when I'm by myself. And when I'm with my class, if I bring a class over, then uh, till maybe 8, you know, and 7.30, 8 o'clock. Yeah, Wonderful. then we go have dinner. Mm -hmm. What a privilege. Um, so this is an interesting question. A few people asked if you could share what app you use to make your photos look painterly. Oh, yeah, it's actually a whole course I teach in, um, I'm gonna look at my phone, that I teach in on iPhone photography. Mm -hmm. And one of those apps that I really liked, um, unfortunately it doesn't work anymore, but it, that was, um, that one isn't isn't working. I mean, they you know they didn't upscale it. But one that is fun to do, fun to use, is called Waterlog. That will turn your photographs into a watercolory. Another one that's fun to use is called Mobile Monet. And so you take a photo, and you should definitely do that for your op art, for your pop. Um, because you can make photographs and they'll get, uh, they'll make them like a black outline, make them kind of poppy actually. And you can change your color scheme. You can make them look really pretty stunning. Um, a fun one that you could do from your garden is called Postali and that's to make like a postcard. So what I like to do is to use, make a photograph, make that photograph with an app that looks wild and then you can choose a postcard and even make your own stamp. So people going to your garden could create a little postcard and then you can choose a um, different kinds of font and font colors and write a message. It's, it's super fun. I, I actually went on this ship called The World and taught all these people um, to do photography with their phones and how to play with apps. And that was the most popular. Well, what, so, what did you say that was called? Post something. Postali. Mm -hmm. P-O-S-T-A-L-E. So you. you can create it yeah. and you can, um, yeah. And, and I have a million more. I have a million more. <laughs> They're, you. yeah, it's really 
it's a super fun thing and you can do it drinking a cup of coffee you can do it with your glass of wine you take all your pictures and then you can sit back and play with them as you're waiting for the airplane you know fun. it's great how wonderful but i like painting better i like painting better but <laughs> <Actually> still <painting. laughs> yeah it's all good it's a good mm -hmm. way to create a steady work i would imagine too yeah. um so we're getting a, an interesting question here. You were there in 1985. Was that not the time of the Great Restoration? Were you there for the entirety of that huge undertaking? Do you have stories from that time? Uh, well, actually, the Great Restoration, the Great Restoration, <laughs> hap began before that. Um, and so the biggest, the, I, when I was there, it was already open to the public, and a lot had been done. Um, and like the excavation of the pond itself that had gotten muddied and rebuilding the bridge itself and a lot of the restoration and the head gardener, Monsieur Valle, he really is to be commended for all that. I was a full-time gardener and I had nine people working for me and considered the best women gardener in Monterey Carmel area. And I would train a lot of people as gardeners, especially women which back then was a big deal 40 years ago. It was unusual to be a professional woman. And, um, but I decided to travel in Europe. And when I went to Monet's garden, I just fell in love with it. And I got a lump in my throat and I thought, I want to work here. And luckily I was with a French woman friend and because I didn't know French. And she said, well, let's, you know, you can stay in the hotel and come back tomorrow. And I said, no, I want to work here. I want to know this garden. I want to contribute. And so she helped me talk to one of the gardeners who suggested that I go to Paris and that I get an appointment with Monsieur Vanderkamp, Gerald Vanderkamp, and see if maybe he could make a position for me. And that took two weeks to get the appointment. And I and he was working and it's a big long story, but I was pouring rain and finally I got my appointment and I was running. I had to get out of the taxi to because bumper to bumper and I was running and I, I arrived and I was like, oh my God, this is Christie's auction house. Oh, this is, oh my God, look at it's a parquet floors and Louis the 14th furniture and I'm dripping wet. And here's this incredible man with, you know, boutonniere and a cigarette holder and three-piece suit and a cane and and a Louis the 14th desk and I dripped over it to shake his hand and introduce myself and his wife Florence came in and they said well we'll build your department and when do you want to start and I was like uh I found out about school and I'm going to learn French and I have to quit my job and move out of my house in Carmel and I'll be back in three months or so that's what I did Wow, how wonderful. You were in the right time at the right place, it sounds like, and uh, <laughs> you charmed them too, so how great. Yeah. Um, someone else has asked about visiting your garden in Carmel. So yes, um, she does oh. have an open garden and studio, and it's on her website, which I put in the chat a few times, so you can check that out there. Um, and then she's also asking if you utilize some of Monet's style in your own garden. Oh, yeah, I could move my little... Um camera around and show you some things but it's um I think when it's my deep love of him and I I see a lot of people who do kind of what I call fake Monet and I don't hope to do that I hope to um really be in deep love of the light and of the place and of the moment and a connection and right now my big work is with trees uh, to paint incredible trees. And I spent a lot of time with trees. So I, and I, I built my studio um, so I can paint really large, being inspired by Monet's water lily paintings and earn the money to build the studio by taking people to Giverny and teaching them. So it's, so that I'm using, you, Monet is like my, uh, one of my mentors and and I use just the colors that he uses. So I use only the, the six paint colors that he uses or once in a while, a couple of others. And then when I use that, I, I can hear, um, sometimes my dreams tell me more colors to, to paint with. And, and I can get, you know, I, I kind of intuit different things from Monet. Mm -hmm. Wow, you sound very connected to him, that's wonderful. 
<laughs> so, <laughs> so this is so actually this is a good segue. Can you share something personal about him or his family history? Uh, well, um, and I think this is something he there's many things, but he married his 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 muse, Camille, who was his model and had two sons with her and they had much struggle. And then uh, she and it, and then at one point um, he went to uh, the Monsieur Hochaday's house, and who was very wealthy and collected all these impressionists, and was asked to paint there. And anyway, Hochaday ended up going bankrupt, and he had become very good friends with Alice. And Alice had six children, her last child on a train. And the Monets were living, they were very hand to mouth, and they said, Come and stay with us. You have no place to stay from being super wealthy to nothing. Bring the six kids. They lived in Vitoy, which was the village right before Giverny. And so here Monet had two women and eight children and they would go into Paris and try to earn some money. And then he found his house and they all, and just before he found his house, uh, his beloved Camille died of consumption, which is uh, bad flu. And they moved there and he had the eight children in alleys and started to garden and paint. And from that, great success came, but also great sorrows. And I could go on, on and on with all the different marriages and children and stories about them. And it's quite unusual and, and complicated. But the thing that I think that I keep going back to, especially during this pandemic, is that Monet had a period where World War I was raging and, it, and one of his sons went off to war and all his workers left. And he was there and he said the only thing an old man can do is paint and that's when he had the vision to to paint these beautiful paintings is for peace and and the pandemic was happening the the flu was happening and people were dying and so to create beauty and stay with what you love and to live your life with meaning you know and doing the best of your skills as an offering those are things that inspire me a great deal about Monet. Wonderful. Sounds like a complex individual. Absolutely. <laughs> As most great artists are. Yeah. Uh, most great people are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, this is this is a nice question. Did Monet ever experiment with the giant Victoria Amazonica lily pad? Oh, that's a good question. Not that I know of. Not that I know of. Um, he did, and I've I've got I've looked at his list that he ordered from the uh, the water lily nursery in the southwest of France um, and I've been able to visit there and they are able to grow them there but he did order um, he did order some lotuses and he did try and there's no reason why he couldn't have grown lotus in that garden temperature wise but my feeling which is just what I think is that when lotus grow there is quite beautiful their stem rises above the water surface and the flower is way high and what he was doing he was painting the reflection on the flat part of the water with the sky and it would give a completely different kind of painting to have the water the lotuses so he um he didn't continue to plant the lotus so that's that is interesting mm -hmm. Yeah, that, and actually someone asked, how deep are his palms? Do you have any well, <laughs> I'm not sure exactly how deep they are, but it is a big deal how, you know, they're not real deep, but um, the, the water lilies have to be grown in containers. Um, mm -hmm. They're not, you know, they're in these plastic tubs now mm -hmm. and they're, they have to be a certain height. And at one point it was too cold so the height of the water, according, is is important, and how where the water lily buckets are is important um, from the surface. And they do usually put in some tropical ones, and of course those have to be taken out. And alongside the greenhouse in the garden is a, a big trough that can be can trough with water, concrete, and that has pipes in it to warm it up, so that some of the tropicals can be put in there. 
Interesting. And then actually speaking of these water lilies, we, as Elizabeth mentioned, we have a talk coming up in May with um, a water lily expert from the Smithsonian. He's a Smithsonian Institution Research Fellow. Um, and as a Smithsonian affiliate, we often uh, work with some of the researchers to offer some talks. And so he is a, he's an expert on water lilies. So he'll be oh, that would be talk about that. Yeah, I want to listen to that one. Yeah, I'll send you the invite for sure. Thank you. Very yeah. cool. So we've gotten a couple more here. Um, someone wanted to know if they use insecticides in the garden. Mm. Yeah, sadly they do. I um, unfortunately they do, and that's not something I'm really for at all. Of course, um, I think Mr. Valle was was trained in the traditional kind of way. Luckily, he was really into good soil, which is the most important thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I think today they're going to be, now he's retired, I think the new head gardener is gonna be much better about not using pesticides. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of pressure to make everything look beautiful and perfect. And mm -hmm. really it's our birds and our butterflies are the most important. Yeah, and we had a few people asking, when you're there, do you see a lot of pollinators and do you hear bird songs? Do you see a lot oh, of yeah. pollinators? Oh, yeah. Oh, I love that part. And early in the morning, there's so many birds. There's so many birds. And around the pond, there's so many frogs. I, when I was gardening there, I thought that I was all by myself gardening uh, by the pond. And I thought the guys were teasing me. I thought they were, you know, they were croaking and croaking. And I was like, oh, okay, you know, and, and no, it was the real frogs. Yeah. <laughs> There's yeah, lots. We're real, they're very happy there, aren't they? <laughs> yeah. Um, a lot of pollinators. Absolutely. Are the ponds stocked with any kind of fish? Yeah, there are fish. Mm -hmm. There are fish. Um, and you'll see them jumping there. There's some carp and there's some trout. Um, the, <laughs> yeah, you'll definitely see fish in there and that helps keep down the mosquitoes or keep down, you know, mm -hmm. it's part of the balance. Yeah. What, what would the equivalent grow zone be um, to the United States? Well, um, the, it's up, it's surprising how north it is. It's mm -hmm. like Vancouver. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, okay. pretty amazing. That is amazing. Mm -hmm. And um, do they get? Do they sell palm trees there? No, no, no. Okay, no palm trees. No. I've seen palm trees in places <laughs> in Europe that it always just surprises. South me. of France. Yeah. Yeah, south of France. Yeah. You know, Monet painted some palm trees in some of his Mediterranean paintings. Yeah, mm -hmm. from the south of France. Mm -hmm. You see beautiful palms and things, the beautiful uh, water, but. No, not in Germany. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, we're Floridians, yeah. so we have to ask that question. Well, yeah. The palm trees. <laughs> <laughs> no palm trees. <laughs> oh, that's the palm trees. Okay. Uh, um, I think our questions are kind of coming to an end here. Oh, someone asked if Virginia creeper is invasive in France. If what? Virginia creeper. Is that invasive in France? Oh, no, it, can, it goes completely dormant. I mean, probably it doesn't in, in, in Florida, but it goes completely dormant. So then the, the house can actually breathe, you know, and it, but I have noticed over the years, just as a restoration, they pulled it all off the house. And at sometimes when just, you know, all gardens go through politics, they go through background stories. And there was times when the house was completely kind of like Monet had it completely covered um, mm. except for the windows. And then somebody would pull it all off and then it would grow back. So. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Well, I think that that's about it. I'm pretty sure we answered most of the questions. Um, and I just want to thank you so much for offering us such a beautiful and joyful presentation today. You're so welcome. You're so welcome. Yeah, it was really fun. <laughs> and really fun. so, you know, we had uh, the most people RSVP for this talk of any virtual talk. Yay. <laughs> yeah, it was amazing. <laughs> well, I'll come back again and give you a, a in this in the life one. Exactly. Yeah, there's so much. And we could do photography or painting. Yeah, Great. there's a both. Well, I, we'd love I, to do maybe some floral arranging with you someday. Oh, floral arranging is great too. Something yeah, like that. And, okay. and I think floral arranging, like it, it's a living um, art form, but also we can learn how to garden design with our floral arranging too. And, 
and it's a sacred thing. It's an offering, you know, with a living. And I teach a um, online watercolor class that we paint flowers and we, it's called the Illustrated Journal of Gratitude. And we do gratitudes and flowers. It's really fun. It's very uh -huh, fun. Great. Well, I think you might yeah. have some converts after today's talk. So. Oh, good. <laughs> good. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Have a great day. Thanks. And thank bye you bye. everyone for joining us. And you recorded this too, didn't you? We did. Yeah, we'll be so, sending that out and feel free to share it. <laughs> thank you. All righty. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.